the news hit me like a sledgehammer to the gut. My husband, Rowan, had just received a call that his estranged uncle, the wealthy business magnate Jonathan Winthrop, had passed away. Your uncle named you as one of the primary beneficiaries in his will, the lawyer on the other end announced. Rowan's eyes widened in disbelief. My uncle? But we haven't spoken in over a decade. Are you certain? Quite certain, Mr. Blackwood. You and your wife are requested to attend the reading of the will tomorrow. As the call ended, Rowan turned to me, his expression a mix of shock and confusion. Alara, this could be our chance to turn things around. Uncle Jonathan's fortune could save our struggling business. I forced a smile, trying to mirror his cautious optimism, but a knot of unease twisted in my stomach. Nothing in life came without a price, and I couldn't shake the feeling that this unexpected windfall would demand a heavy toll. The next day we found ourselves in the opulent study of Jonathan Winthrop's sprawling mansion, surrounded by his legal team and other potential beneficiaries. As the lawyer started reading the will, a hush fell over the room. To my estranged nephew, Rowan Blackwood, and his wife, Alara, I bequeath my entire estate including this property and all assets, on one condition. My heart raced as the lawyer paused for dramatic effect. Rowan squeezed my hand, his palm clammy. They must take up permanent residence in this mansion for a period of no less than one year. A collective gasp filled the room, but one voice rose above the others, dripping with venom. This is an outrage, Rowan's mother, Margot, spat. That inheritance is rightfully mine. I'm Jonathan's only living relative. Her eyes locked onto me, filled with undisguised hatred. Her, this is that little gold digger's doing, I'm sure of it. Rowan stepped forward, his jaw clenched. Mother, you have no right. Don't you dare take her side, you ungrateful whelp. Margot hissed, her words slicing like knives. The lawyer cleared his throat, attempting to restore order. The terms are clear, Mrs. Winthrop. If Mr. and Mrs. Blackwood fail to meet the residence requirement, the entire estate will be distributed among various charities. Margot's eyes narrowed dangerously. Mark my words, you'll regret this. That mansion and everything in it belong to me by rights. I'll make your life a living hell until you surrender what's mine. As her gaze bored into me, a chill ran down my spine. I knew, in that moment, our lives had taken an irrevocable turn, and the battle lines had been drawn. A week later, we stood before the looming gates of Winthrop Manor, our new home, or gilded cage as it felt. The ancient stone edifice seemed to stare down at us, its gothic spires like accusing fingers against the slate-gray sky. "'Are you sure about this?' I asked Rowan, my grip tightening on his hand. He offered a grim smile. "'We don't have a choice if we want a future. Just promise me you'll be careful around Mother.' As if on cue, the gates creaked open, and Margot emerged from the shadows like a specter, her expression a rictus of disdain. "'So the prodigal son returns,' she sneered and he brings his little bride into my home. I fought the urge to recoil as her eyes raked over me with undisguised loathing. This is Uncle Jonathan's home now, Mother, Rowan said, his voice strained. We're here to honor his wishes. His wishes? Margot barked a harsh laugh. That senile old fool was manipulated in his final days, no thanks to your scheming wife, I'm sure. Before I could respond, she stepped closer, her face inches from mine. Listen closely, you conniving little tramp. This is my domain, and I'll make your life a waking nightmare until you slink back to whatever hovel you crawled out of. Rowan pulled me back, shielding me with his body. That's enough, mother. You've gone too far. Margot's lips curled into a cruel smile. We'll see about that. As she turned and stormed back towards the manor, I felt a shiver run down my spine. The games had begun. Over the following weeks, Margot's campaign of subtle torment intensified. Priceless heirlooms went missing, only to reappear in bizarre locations. Strange noises echoed through the halls at night, keeping me awake. And the servants treated me with thinly veiled contempt, no doubt following Margot's lead. She's just trying to rattle you, Rowan insisted. But I could see the doubt creeping into his eyes. One night, as I descended the grand staircase, I felt a violent shove from behind. I tumbled down the steps, searing pain lancing through my body as I crashed to the marble floor. When I finally regained my senses, Margot was standing over me, a sickening grin plastered across her face. Clumsy girl, she purred. You should be more careful. As she turned and walked away, I felt a cold certainty settle in my gut. 
This was no longer a game to her. Margot was willing to go to any lengths to drive me out, even if it meant destroying me in the process. After the accident on the stairs, I knew I couldn't trust anyone in that house. Except perhaps Rowan, but even his loyalty was becoming strained by his mother's vicious campaign against me. I took to wandering the manor's shadowy corridors at night when everyone else was asleep, searching for any clue that could expose Margot's true motives. On one such foray, I discovered a hidden door behind an antique bookcase, leading to a dust-covered study that seemed untouched for decades. Inside, I found a trove of old letters and documents, including correspondence between Margot and Jonathan in their younger years. What I read made my blood run cold. It appeared Margot had been stealing from the family fortune for years through elaborate financial schemes, only to be cut off by Jonathan when he uncovered her deceit. As I dug deeper, I also uncovered evidence that Margot had once been involved with a shady business partner of Jonathan's, a man who later disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Had Margot gone so far as to have him killed to cover her tracks? Armed with this damning information, I knew I had to confront her, once and for all. But when I tried to show the evidence to Rowan, he refused to believe his beloved mother was capable of such depravity. These letters prove nothing, he snapped, pushing the documents away. Mother has been nothing but generous and loving her entire life. I think you're allowing your imagination to run wild. Don't be a fool, Rowan, I cried my frustration boiling over. Can't you see she's manipulating you, just like she's been doing your entire life? His jaw tightened, and I realized I'd struck a nerve. Get out. I need some time alone to think about. All of this. As I left him brooding in the study, a pit of dread opened in my stomach. Margot's web of lies was so intricately woven, so deeply rooted in Rowan's psyche, that I feared nothing short of a miracle could make him see the truth. In the days that followed, strange occurrences began plaguing me again. More missing valuables, eerie scratching sounds from behind the walls, and an increasing sense of being watched. I knew Margot was behind it all, but I could never catch her in the act. Then, one evening, the servants began whispering about a scandalous story that had surfaced in the local papers, depicting me as a shameless gold digger who had ensnared Rowan through nefarious means. The vicious lies left me reeling, and I knew Margot's hand was behind this public defamation. When I confronted Rowan about it, he seemed conflicted, torn between his loyalty to me and his ingrained devotion to his mother. Perhaps it would be best if you left for a while, he said, unable to meet my eyes, at least until this blows over. As I stared at the man I loved, I realized our relationship was hanging by a thread, fraying under the relentless onslaught of Margot's cruelty. If I didn't act soon, I would lose everything. My home, my husband, and any chance at the life we'd dreamed of. The battle lines had been drawn, and I would have to fight with every weapon at my disposal if I hoped to survive the war Margot had declared. No matter the cost, I wouldn't go down without a fight. In the aftermath of the vicious newspaper story, the atmosphere at Winthrop Manor became suffocating. Rowan grew increasingly distant, torn between his loyalty to me and his lifelong conditioning by his manipulative mother. Meanwhile, Margot's underhanded tactics escalated in boldness and cruelty. It all came to a head one chilly autumn night. I had retired early to the bedroom Rowan and I shared, exhausted from another day of walking on eggshells in that accursed house. As I prepared for bed, a faint scratching sound came from the adjoining dressing room, like fingernails on wood. My heart pounding, I crept toward the noise, pushing open the dressing room door. That's when I saw it, a blazing trail of liquid snaking along the floor towards the piles of cast-off clothing. The unmistakable scent of kerosene filled my nostrils, seconds before the first lick of flame consumed the fabric. I stumbled back, choking on thick black smoke as the fire spread with terrifying speed. By the time I made it back into the bedroom, flames licked hungrily at the draperies and seared my lungs. I clawed desperately at the bedroom door, but some force held it firmly in place from the other side. Help! Rowan! Please, someone help me! I screamed, panic clawing at my throat as the room became an inferno around me. Then, over the roar of the blaze, I heard it, Margot's shrill laughter cutting through the chaos. That twisted cackle would haunt my nightmares for the rest of my days. 
Just as the searing pain and smoke threatened to overwhelm me, the bedroom door exploded inward with a thunderous crack. Rowan burst in, soot streaking his panic-stricken face, and pulled me bodily from the conflagration raging within. I don't remember much after that, only fragments of being rushed to the hospital, bandages binding my scorched skin, and the vacant look in Rowan's eyes as he watched over me in silence. When I finally regained my senses days later, Rowan sat slumped by my bedside, his expression hardening as I recounted the night's events. "'She tried to kill you,' he muttered in a hollow tone, the truth he had been so desperate to deny finally settling in his bones. "'My own mother.' I took his hand, ignoring the sting of my blistered skin, and made him meet my gaze. She has to be stopped, Rowan, before this goes any further. His eyes smoldered with rage and anguish, I know. But even then, as he said the words, I could see the fractures splintering his loyalty, the product of a lifetime's manipulation threatening to reassert itself. Margot's twisted lies had sunk their hooks in deep, and I feared they might never fully release their grip on the man I loved. Rowan pressed his forehead to my hand, his next words barely more than a pained whisper. I want to believe you, Alara, more than anything, but without proof, without knowing the full truth of what she's done. He trailed off, and in that moment I felt more alone than I ever had in my life, as if I were drifting helplessly at sea with no anchor to hold me in place. It was then that I knew I would have to take matters into my own hands if I had any hope of surviving Margot's vendetta and salvaging what little remained of my crumbling life. Whatever the cost, I had to find a way to expose that vile woman's sins before they destroyed me completely. After the harrowing ordeal of the fire, I knew I couldn't remain a passive victim any longer. If I didn't take decisive action, Margot's malicious games would consume me completely. Rowan's loyalty was hanging by a frayed thread, and it was clear I couldn't rely on him to protect me from his mother's ruthless machinations. In the depths of that long, agonizing night following the inferno, a newfound resolve took root within me. I would gather whatever allies and evidence I could to finally expose Margot for the vicious, conniving snake she truly was, even if it meant facing her darkness head-on. My first step was contacting the local authorities and providing them with the damning letters and documents I'd uncovered, detailing Margot's financial crimes and the mysterious disappearance of Jonathan's former business partner. While the police seemed skeptical at first, the mounting pile of evidence against her could not be easily dismissed. Next, I reached out to an unlikely source, Francine, one of the manor's longest-serving maids who had endured Margot's cruel treatment for decades. Years of pent-up resentment bubbled to the surface as I revealed what I knew of Margot's misdeeds. That wretched harpy has had her talons in me since I were a young girl, Francine hissed, her voice thick with hatred. Blackmail, threats, you name it, she's a right evil one, that's for certainty. With Francine's help, I began uncovering even more of Margot's sordid secrets, illicit affairs, underhanded business dealings, and long-buried scandals that she'd worked tirelessly to conceal. It became increasingly clear that her entire life was a meticulously constructed web of lies and deceit. However, the final piece of the puzzle remained maddeningly elusive, the key to unraveling her twisted scheme against me and exposing her murderous intentions once and for all. That crucial lead finally came from an unexpected source, Margot's own estranged younger sister, Emma, who had been ostracized from the family years ago. I received an anonymous letter from her, detailing a particularly vicious confrontation that had driven her from Winthrop Manor in disgrace. Margot has always been rotten to the core, Emma wrote in a shaky hand. Petty, vindictive, utterly consumed by greed and status. But you must know the truth about what really happened the night our father died, the real reason she turned on me so viciously. My hands trembled as I read on, the final horrifying revelation unfolding like a serpent unfurling its coils. Emma claimed that on the night of their father's fatal heart attack, she had discovered Margot rifling through his safe and pocketing wads of cash and valuable documents. When Emma threatened to expose her sister's despicable actions, Margot had snapped, unleashing a torrent of vile accusations and threats that left Emma fearing for her very life. In that moment, I knew I held the linchpin, the damning evidence that could finally topple Margot's house of cards 
and reveal the true depravity lurking behind her meticulously crafted facade. Armed with Emma's testimony and the weight of everything I'd uncovered, I resolved to bring the full truth to light in a final, climactic confrontation. No more games, no more veiled threats or skirting the periphery of Margot's secrets. It was time to wield the power of her own sins as a weapon and cut her down to size once and for all. As I steeled myself for the impending battle, I could almost feel the gathering storm rumbling in the distance, heavy with the promise of reckoning. Margot's reign of terror and deception was nearing its end by her own hand or by mine. The day of reckoning arrived sooner than I expected. I had summoned the estate's executors, the police, and a few trusted allies to bear witness as I finally stripped away Margot's veil of lies and deception. We gathered in the manor's grand hall, the vaulted ceiling seeming to press down with the weight of the impending confrontation. Rowan stood apart from the others, his expression haunted as he steeled himself for the ugliness to come. Margot swept in fashionably late, as was her style, her haughty gaze sweeping over the assembled crowd with a mix of disdain and bemusement. Well, well, to what do I owe this merry little gathering? She arched an inquisitive eyebrow at me. Don't tell me my dear daughter-in-law is hatching another pathetic scheme for attention. Cut the act, Margot. I spat, my anger simmering just beneath the surface. Your game is up. We know everything. For a split second, a flicker of uncertainty danced across her face before the mask reasserted itself. I haven't the faintest idea what you're raving about, you delusional little. Save your venom, I snarled, retrieving a thick manila envelope with a trembling hand. We have all the proof we need of your lies, your crimes, your murderous intentions. As I began laying out the damning trail of evidence, the letters, the financial records, Emma's testimony, Margot's expression shifted from derision to outright fury. Her eyes bulged with unbridled rage as each new revelation compounded the last. That sniveling traitorous whore, she screeched when I revealed Emma's words. How dare she slander me with these absurd fairy tales? Rowan took an involuntary step backward, as if her outburst had struck him bodily. It was the first crack in his staunch denial, the first glimmer of realization seeping through. These are nothing but malicious fabrications, Margot raged on, turning her vitriol towards the executors and police. I demand you remove these despicable liars from my home at once. But they stood firm, unmoved by her bluster as the weight of the evidence became insurmountable. With an animalistic shriek of pure fury, Margot turned on me, her immaculately manicured fingernails hooked like talons. "'You ungrateful, conniving little snake,' she howled, spittle flying from her lips. "'This is all you're doing, isn't it? You could never be content with an ounce of my generosity. Well, I'll see you utterly destitute and ruined for this, I swear on my life.' In that moment she seemed to swell to an even more grotesque, inhuman form— a twisted, wrath-filled harpy clawing desperately at the unraveling threads of her meticulously crafted lies. Rowan moved to intervene, to shield me from his mother's incandescent rage, but I held up a hand to stop him. I would face her unbridled fury and let it consume itself to bitter ashes. "'It's over, Margot,' I said, startled by the calm resolution in my own voice. "'No more lies, no more manipulations. Your house of cards has collapsed around you.' and this time there's no escaping the consequences of your actions. For a long, breathless moment, she seemed on the verge of unleashing another torrent of rage and denial. But then, something shifted in her eyes. The fight bled out of her, letting the mask slip just a bit to reveal the hollowed broken thing that lurked beneath. As the police moved to take her into custody, Margot didn't resist. She simply sagged in on herself like a deflating husk, and allowed herself to be led away in contemptuous silence. Only then did the floodgates open for Rowan. He crumpled to the floor in racking sobs, all the years of anguish and torment finally spilling forth. As I gathered him in my arms, I knew both healing and hardship still lay ahead. Though Margot's twisted games had been exposed, shattered shards of her poisoned legacy still remained, fractures that would take years to mend if they ever fully could. But in that moment— Allowing the cathartic release to wash over us both, I knew we would persevere. Margot's tyranny had been broken, and from the ashes of her ruination, perhaps some semblance of hard-won peace could finally take root. In the aftermath of Margot's explosive unraveling, 
the consequences of her depravity unfurled like a wildfire, consuming everything in its path. The evidence we had gathered proved irrefutable. Records of embezzlement, blackmail, corporate sabotage, and even mounting circumstantial ties to at least one suspicious disappearance. As the full extent of her sins came to light through a highly publicized legal prosecution, the reactions from her once vaunted social circles ranged from shock and revulsion to a perverse sort of schadenfreude. Who would have thought prim proper Margot Winthrop was really such a degenerate monster? I overheard one well-coiffed matron murmur to her companion outside the courthouse. She always seemed so genteel and refined. Just goes to show you never really know someone, do you? For her part, Margot embraced her infamy with a sort of deranged defiance, lashing out with unrestrained vitriol at every turn. It was as if, now that her facade had been irreparably shattered, she delighted in flaunting the full breadth of her depravity. You imbeciles have no inkling of what I've sacrificed to maintain our family's status and legacy, she screeched during one courtroom tirade. You're fortunate I didn't have the lot of you disposed of the same way as that sniveling worm Jonathan's partner. A collective gasp went up from the gallery, feeding Margot's twisted delight like a starving flame. She turned her blazing eyes towards Rowan and me, and I felt an involuntary shudder at the naked loathing burning in their depths. Look at them, cowering like the gutless fools they are. You're the reason our noble lineage lies in ashes, the both of you, weak-willed, pathetic. Her venomous diatribe was finally cut off by the stern banging of the judge's gavel. But even as the bailiffs muscled her away, Margot directed one last look of pure, unbridled hatred in our direction. A silent promise that this war was far from over, at least in her mind. Over the following weeks, Margot's downfall accelerated with dizzying speed. Asset seizures, criminal indictments, and the inexorable avalanche of public censure stripped away what tattered remnants of status and influence she had once wielded like a blunt instrument. Yet through it all, she remained utterly defiant and unrepentant. They'll all get what's coming to them, mark my words, she spat at reporters camped outside her palatial estate, now little more than an empty, echoing mausoleum. This is far from over, you mealy-mouthed vultures. Unfortunately for Margot, her rabid threats and unhinged ravings only further cemented her legacy as a once powerful matriarch, undone by her own boundless avarice and corruption. Society had turned its back on her with a mixture of pity and disdain, leaving her bitter screeds to be consumed by indifferent winds. On the day her sentencing was finally handed down, a staggering array of charges resulting in a harsh multi-year prison term, Margot unleashed a final, unrestrained torrent of malice. "'Curse all of you!' she howled, thrashing against the iron grip of the bailiffs as they tried to drag her from the courtroom. "'Especially you, Alara! This is far from over, you hear me?' I'll have my revenge if it's the last thing I... Whatever final, dire imprecation she intended was cut off as she disappeared through the door, the slam of iron against wood echoing through the court like a grim period. Silence hung heavy for several breathless seconds, and then the hushed murmurs began rippling through the gallery once more. A vile chapter had finally been closed. The damage caused by one woman's unchecked ambition and malice laid horrifyingly bare. As Rowan and I embraced in the wake of that sordid spectacle, I knew our own road towards healing and redemption would be long and arduous. The scars left by Margot's cruelty ran deeper than any inflicted wound. But at least now, at long last, we could begin to rebuild what she had so nearly destroyed. With the poison she had injected into our lives finally excised, there was a chance to nurture something new from the blighted, burned remains of our former existences. Those tender green shoots wouldn't take root overnight, of course. Deep, ravaging fires leave extensive scarring in their wake, but we would tend the ashes dutifully, allowing new life to gradually emerge, hushed and humble at first, then growing stronger and more resilient with each passing season. It was the only way to banish Margot's toxic legacy once and for all, by cultivating the power to persevere where her hatred and corruption could only hope to wither and decay. In the weeks following Margot's sentencing, an eerie silence descended over Winthrop Manor. The echoing halls, once electric with her malicious presence, now felt like a vacuum, the stifling calm before the soft patter of new life begins to take tentative root. 
Rowan and I moved through those early days in a numb haze, going through the motions of setting the manor to rights, but still emotionally adrift from the cataclysm that had reshaped our lives so violently. We spoke in hushed tones, as if afraid to disturb some lingering malignant force hovering in the shadows. The servants, finally freed of Margot's tyrannical grasp, tiptoed about their duties with the same wary restraint as field mice anticipating the return of a prowling cat. Then, one crisp autumn morning, I awoke to find Rowan sitting at the foot of our bed, his shoulders hunched and head bowed beneath some invisible weight. Rowan, I murmured, reaching out a hand to his arm. What's wrong? For a long moment he didn't respond, simply staring down at his calloused palms as if they belonged to a stranger. Finally, he drew a long, shuddering breath. I spent so many years letting her gnaw away at my soul, Alara. No matter how vile she became, some part of me could never let go of the fantasy that she actually loved me, deep down. Tears welled in his eyes, voice cracking with a lifetime's worth of hurt and disappointment. She was my mother. I should have protected you from her poisonous lies and cruelty, but I was weak, blinded by delusions of the mother I so desperately wanted her to be. He looked up at me then, anguish etched in the creases of his face. Can you ever forgive me? In that moment, I felt my own emotions surge forward like a raging river breaking its banks, not just for the hell Margot had put us through, but for all the lost years we could have spent growing together instead of being warped and diminished by her hatred. I pulled Rowan into a fierce embrace as the dam finally burst, wave after wave of purging sobs racking our bodies in unison. We wept for the wounds that had been inflicted, the scars that would always remain, and the hollow ache of what could have been. But we also wept for the promise of what lay ahead, a new world where Margot's poisonous influence could never again take root. In the days and weeks that followed, we slowly began the work of reclaiming our lives. The manor underwent a top-to-bottom scouring and refurbishment, every last remnant of Margot's corruption purged as if by ritual cleansing. We let go of much of the staff that had enabled her cruelties, opting for a fresh start surrounded by new faces and loyalties. Gone were the dark furnishings, grim draperies, and oppressive decor, through which her malice had seeped like a miasma. In their place, we cultivated light, open spaces, and vibrant designs that spoke of rebirth rather than decay. Slowly, tentatively, the scars began to heal into the thick protective calluses of hard-won resilience and perseverance. What gave me the most solace and hope for our future, however, was witnessing Rowan's own metamorphosis, where once Margot's manipulations had shaped him into a wavering, conflict-averse shell of a man, now I saw an indomitable pillar of resolve and integrity taking form. Gone were the haunted looks and furtive self-doubts. In their place stood a man embracing his role as master of his own destiny, unbowed by the specter of his mother's grievous wrongs. Five years after Margot's ruination, Winthrop Manor had been virtually rebuilt from the ground up, retrofitted into not just a home, but a nexus for charitable endeavors aimed at empowering those who had once suffered as we had. Battered women's shelters, youth outreach initiatives, counseling programs, all thrived beneath the roof once shadowed by malice and oppression. We dedicated our newfound resources to cultivating the kindness and goodwill Margot had sought so voraciously to extinguish. And though I knew her poisoned roots would never be fully extractable, watching the fruits of our rebirth blossom with each passing year was the greatest victory I could have hoped to wrest from her clutches. On the eve of the annual charity gala we hosted at the manor, I caught Rowan staring pensively out the window towards the vast Sylvan estate grounds, a pensive smile playing across his weathered features. "'Do you ever think about her?' he asked without turning to face me. "'About your spite for mother, I mean?' I considered the weight of his question for a long moment before answering. "'She doesn't haunt my thoughts much these days,' I admitted. "'Not out of spite or indifference, but rather resolve. Our eyes met then, a deep understanding passing between us. Margot's hatred very nearly destroyed everything, our relationship, our livelihood, our very souls. But we survived. We persevered through the darkness she inflicted and remade something beautiful from the ashes. I laced my fingers through his, marveling at how far we'd come. That is the greatest revenge we could ever claim over her bitterness and cruelty. 
not by perpetuating the cycle of hurt, but by overcoming it and choosing to nurture the light she fought so desperately to smother. Hand in hand, we stood in comfortable silence, watching the golden rays of dusk gild the grounds, the lands and legacy we had reclaimed in the name of all that was good, just, and true. Our tomorrow was unwritten, filled with untold promise and possibility. But I knew, without a shred of doubt, that whatever challenges lay ahead, we would meet them as we had every other, overcoming hate with love, healing old wounds, and ensuring even Margot's darkest of legacies could never take permanent root.